Hi, Dr. Marianne here. I'd like to read from the SCF report for you again. I'm reading at page 23, the battle to legalize SCF. By 1938, Renee's support had grown enormously. Another petition was circulated. By this time, it, it had garnered 55,000 signatures. The public, along with many doctors and professionals from all walks of life were demanding in no uncertain terms that Renee be allowed to, in effect, practice medicine without a license. Frank Kelly, a member of the legislature, went so far as to have election handbills printed that displayed Renee's picture and quoted her as saying she had Premier Hepburn's assurance that legislation would soon be introduced, which would allow her to operate her clinic legally. Imagine if you were to, if you will, the wrath Renee was about to incur from the medical establishment firmly entrenched in her faith, um, in their faith, in the wonders of modern medicine, a medical establishment that legally held the power to crush anyone with the audacity to practice the art of healing, not in accordance with the precepts of the ordained faith. In March of 1938, a private bill was introduced uh, by Frank Kelly, which proposed that Renee Cassie be officially authorized to practice medicine in Ontario, Canada, in the treatment of cancer in all its forms and human ailments and conditions resulting therefrom. Renee desperately wanted legislation passing passed, allowing her to treat patients before they were diagnosed as terminal because the doctors were not sending her patients until the last stages of the disease. Patients who had already been subjected to the traumas of traditional cancer treatments. They were all but killing their patients before she was even given a chance to help them. In Renee's words, medical science has nothing to offer the cancer sufferer but x-ray, radium, and surgery. Radiation has the opposite effect. It causes cancer. Radium drives it in instead of out and burns the surrounding tissues. The medical establishment naturally perceived the proposed legislation as a direct attack on their credibility, indeed their entire reason for existing. Their response was not surprising. Dr. Faulkner, who had in the past been sympathetic to Renee, was replaced as Minister of Health by Harold Kirby. Harold, quote unquote, would not see the honor of modern medicine science tainted. In the beginning of March, 1938, the Kirby bill was introduced into legislation. Briefly stated, the Kirby bill was created according to its defenders as a way to get the truth about unorthodox cancer treatments. Renee's treatment being of course the main target. The Kirby bill would protect the public because it would discover if controversial treatments had merit. The Kirby bill would therefore have the power to establish a Royal Cancer Commission to investigate all possible cancer treatments. Renee would be allowed to offer evidence of the Royal Cancer Commission, which would be composed of respected members of the Canadian College of Physicians and Surgeons. If and only if her evidence was conclusive, the Cancer Commission would then legalize ESIAC. There were, however, a few minor stipulations. The formulas for all treatments investigated must be turned over to the Cancer Commission. If one refused to divulge the, the formula, one was subject to a fine of $100 to $500 the first time they were caught treating a patient and $500 to $2,500 a second time and for each subsequent offense. Failure to pay the fine would result in 30 days to six months in prison. But according to the Kirby Bill, all members of the Cancer Commission would be required to maintain the confidentiality of the formulas submitted for review. But if, there, if the esteemed members accidentally or otherwise broke this confidentiality, there would of course be no penalties for their breach of fiduciary duty. Renee was outraged when she heard about the bill. 
She believed if she turned over the formula to the Cancer Commission, they would never keep it secret. She quote unquote, the people of Ontario will be paying a group of men to develop something that was developed and discovered 15 years ago. I have developed and proven a cure right here in, Bra in Bracebridge, and I am running a clinic where hundreds of cancer sufferers are being treated and helped. Why then should I be asked to give my formula over to a group of doctors who never did anything to earn it? If the Ontario legislation legislature can pass a law to put me in jail for six months for helping suffering people, I will close my clinic and go to the United States. I shall not buck such opposition. I'm gonna make that my little flag right there. So naturally Renee's supporters were determined to see that the bill be passed and the Kirby bill defeated. Renee's bill was the first to be debated in the legislature. According to transcripts, the debate was fierce. Renee's lawyer opened with, patients and their relatives are reporting that doctors are refusing to give Renee diagnosis of cancer and that a, 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 cabal, a cabal has been organized by the medical profession against her. The charge was met with cries of untrue and shame by members of the legislature. Another gentleman rose to his feet and declared, my mother was a cancer patient, yet three doctors refused to give her a written diagnosis for Miss Cassie, though they gave it to my mother verbally. Scores of patients in the gallery applauded his statement with such enthusiasm that Speaker David Kroll threatened to expel them from the House. If you don't settle down, the Speaker went on to say, the government is setting up a board to deal with these reported cures, referring to the Cancer Commission to be established when the Kirbyville passed, a foregone conclusion. Members of Parliament, Duckworth, Armstrong, and Somerville all gave impassioned speeches as to why the bill should be passed. Each time they gave the name of a terminal patient they had known personally who had been cured of the treatments with ESIAC. And then Renee was allowed to take the stand. The legislature was silent as she spoke. She said, the fact that I can get any results at all should be accepted as a good thing. When I had success, I thought doctors would welcome me with open arms. I didn't anticipate antagonism from the profession. I expected cooperation and I have every respect for the profession. She told the legislature she would gladly give her formula to the world without any thought of gain. If I knew that it would be given to humanity in the same way, I have never asked a patient for one cent. I've been glad to have, I have been glad to donate, um, to have made the donation. I have been glad to have donations of one and two dollars, but I have never asked a patient if they had money. I treated them whether they had it or not. All she really wanted was for the medical profession to admit that ESIAC had merit based on the results that she had already obtained. Then she would become, then she would welcome any type of investigation. My clinic is wide open to any investigation at all times, she said. One is struck at her naivete and brevity and bravery. All she wanted was the medical establishment to abandon every sacred belief they clung to about the treatment of cancer. When she finished speaking, a motion was put forth calling for the bill not to be reported. A vote was taken by a show of hands. Renee's bill was defeated by just three votes on the grounds that to allow it would be the same as endorsing her treatment as a cure remedy. Clearly she had a tremendous amount of support, but in the end, it wasn't enough. A few days later, the Kirby bill was easily passed into law. Renee notified her, her patients that she would be closing her clinic. I regret, regret with all my heart closing my cancer clinic here at Bracebridge. I battled with the medical profession, but when it comes to fighting the law of the province, it's much too much for me. 
one premier minister of health once, wait, I'm sorry, the premier and the minister of health were deluged with letters demanding to know why Renee had been forced to close her doors. One letter typically at that time was written by Dr. M. M. Andercheck of, of Timon's Ontario. Quote, it has been a very severe blow to me as well as to many of the sufferers who he, to hear that Miss Cassie was forced to close her clinic. I think it's a great injustice to the hundreds of sufferers from the dreadful disease who Miss Cassie has also greatly benefited. My wife was one of her patients and for the last three months, it has gained, um, has gained in health and confidence and was looking for, forward to regaining her health again. You know, this just baffles me. Sorry for the interruption of the phone. I was setting my timer to see how long I was reading. I accidentally set a timer to stop. But, um, you know, what I, when I help kids learn to read with music, with dyslexia, I'm, I get the resistance as well. It's just amazing how you have something that proves successful and people just fight it. It's the politics of it. It's the monopoly. Uh, they want their big things to go forth. And we know big pharmacy has their plans. So anyway, this man writes, my own wife was a patient of hers. And for the last three months, she has gained in health and confidence and was looking forward to regaining her health again. She's only 34 years of age and a mother of three of a three-year-old child. It seems such a pity to take away the opportunity from a person her age to regain health and happiness to which every person is entitled to and leave nothing but despair. Under incredible, that was the end of the quote, under incredible public pressure, Premier Hepburn and Health Minister Kirby thought it politically wise to ask Renee to reopen her clinic. She was reassured that she would not be charged under the new Kirby law. She consented and patients were overjoyed. That's the end of this reading on page 27. Um, hope you listened and enjoyed what you, what you read. If you would like and subscribe to this channel, that is how you could help me the most and share it with other people fighting cancer. I am... Um, what do they call it? Spontaneous remission, where the healing has come for me after surgery. And I just want to get the word out about ESIAC to more and more people. So thanks for listening. Bye now. I'm Dr. Marianne Cintron.